So uh, we are at, well, we're actually past time. So we'll go ahead and get started. The prayer for today is actually, it, it's titled A Prayer of Preparation for, for Whit Sunday, uh, which is the old name for Pentecost. Uh, if you grew up with the TLH, um, you may have heard it called Whit Sunday uh, when you were a child. Uh, I don't know anybody who calls it that now. Um, Whit Sunday is the old, it's an old German term uh, for, for White Sunday or Wisdom Sunday. Uh, this would be the Sunday, like, say, in Sweden, for example. Um, although a lot of the, the medieval church would do all their baptisms on the vigil of Easter or on Easter, uh, in Sweden, for example, uh, the temperature wasn't always very nice for having baptisms when you consider that people got baptized naked. Uh, so they would have the baptisms on Pentecost because by then it's a little bit warmer. Um, and so this Sunday became known as, as Whit Sunday, as White Sunday, Wisdom Sunday. This would be the Sunday that the baptismal candidates receive their white robes. Um, so Whit Sunday, Pentecost, same thing. Uh, but this is a prayer to the Holy Spirit, which we don't get uh, too often, uh, so I kind of like it. So, let us pray. Lord God, Holy Spirit, who on the sacred day of Pentecost filled the hearts of the apostles with new gifts, enlighten our hearts also, and grant that we may keep the feast devoutly. Come, precious guest of our hearts, come, only treasure of our souls, Dwell in us as your temple. Purify our hearts from sin. Make us all the anointed of the Lord and help us by your power to resist all our spiritual enemies and to obtain the victory. In our prayers and thanksgivings, intercede for us with groanings too deep for words. Comfort all troubled hearts that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Support us by your power against the accusations of our heart and conscience that there may be no condemnation for us. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds unto joy everlasting. Give and grant us, O God, Holy Spirit, sincere joy in this holy feast. And when this life is done, let us ever proclaim your wondrous works, who with the Father and the Son are most blessed forever. Amen. Yeah. Lots of uh, scriptural uh, allusions in, in this prayer. I like the, these old prayers. Um, and this one had the interesting one, that the bones that you have broken rejoice. Where did we hear that? Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. We said it on Sunday in a psalm, Psalm 51. You know, that David talks about, he uses this physical imagery for being crushed by the law, that the bones that you have broken uh, rejoice, as in, uh, let me who have been brought to repentance by your law also hear your gospel. Uh, that's what David's talking about. You know, so when we get to that in like Psalm 51 and David's talking about broken bones, he's not talking about a broken arm. <laughs> he's using that as an illustration for uh, repentance that is wrought by the preaching of the law. So, but speaking of the law, we are in the book of Exodus. And where did we leave off last week? 37. 37. Yes. So we likely will finish, and for those of you who have come in since, I have brought, if we finish Exodus today, if, um, I've brought an article that I printed out from the Lutheran Witness from May 2010 uh, on the Ascension. So I, I figured we could read this together if we finish our study of Exodus here. And the sad thing is, it's from May 2010. I remember reading this because uh, I was in seminary by that point uh, and got it in my seminary mailbox. So that's sad. 11 years ago, I was in seminary. That's sad. Okay, so last week, we heard about the kind of the making, the beginning of the making of all these things that we've heard about, the, the tabernacle and all its fixings, you know, the basin and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and we heard how the Lord gave these two guys, uh, Bezalel and Oholiab, the ability to do all this stuff. You know, that, and not only the, the ability to do all this stuff, but also the ability to teach. You know, um, I have to, I usually learn by doing things or reading a book. Um, some people learn by experience, uh, but these guys were given the spirit to be able to teach, and I imagine that these other craftsmen that they taught were also given the spirit to, to learn. Uh, and so they taught how to do all this stuff, and then there was this contribution we read about that the, Moses put out that the people who had it in their heart to bring stuff for the building of the tabernacle should bring it. Uh, and how did that contribution go? It went well, because what happened? They gave too much. Yeah, they gave too much. They had to stop. They said, we're building the church. Everybody who wants to contribute, bring some stuff. And then they said, this church is going to be too big. Stop bringing stuff. No, oh, that's fantastic. You know? And most of this, I guess, would be from plunder from the Egyptians. You know, I guess that's put to good use. You, know, you plunder the Egyptians, and then you use their their gold and silver and whatnot and their, their precious yarns and uh, linens and use that to make the tabernacle. Well, was there some fighting in between? I think so. Yeah, weren't there? Probably there from their plunder to Amalekites. Yeah, there were the Amalekites, wasn't it? Um, that they were passing through, the Amalekites thought they would be easy pickings, and then we had the uh, Joshua and Aaron holding up Moses' arm. We had that earlier. I think that happened already. You know, but most of the fighting is yet to come. You know, once we get into the promised land, that's where most of the fighting is going to come uh, because we have all those guys who are there now that need to be dealt with. Um, so that's in the book of Joshua. Maybe, maybe we should read Joshua. We can, we can uh, bring our swords with us, and I don't know. Yeah, and that's an interesting topic, too, and, and it's not an easy one. You know, when we get into the conquests, you know, how, how should we look at that and feel about that? That's, that's an interesting topic, too, maybe for another day. So let's go into Exodus 37, and we're getting to the ark. It says, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. Uh, so not terribly huge. You have a footnote there that a cubit is about 18 inches. Uh, and what did I say is the easy, easy way? Laura's doing it back there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we all, we all have the same cubit except for Silas. Maybe like that, I don't know. And Ben, I imagine Ben, you know, or, or Gideon someday, this kid is. We're looking at 18-month clothes for this kid. He's eight months old. Like the puppy. <laughs> Stop it. Well, see, a puppy does what I tell it to. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that Gideon has that a puppy doesn't have is a diaper. Although some puppies have diapers, don't they? <laughs> anyway. Okay, verse 2. Oh, so the ark is not huge, right? It's uh, 36 inches or so, or no, 36 and a half, so 45 inches uh, by, you know, say two feet by another two feet. It's not a huge box. And what I find interesting just in the moment here is that uh, the number of times God says to Moses, the way I'm telling you to do it, do it that way. You know, and here is Bezalel doing that. He's using the instructions that God gave Moses, you know, doing the dimensions and stuff like that. And uh, I can think of all sorts of examples from my own life where somebody tell, you know, my dad, for example, tells me to do something and then I do it my own way and then it either goes well or not. Or maybe you've had this with your children or you say, you know, you know how to do it so you try to get them to do it this way and then they... They mess it up, you know, or something like that. And you go, why, why didn't you do it the way I told you? Um, that happens. Uh, but here, in this case, God said, 
I'm giving you the instructions. Do it this way, because if you don't, that's going to be bad. Right. Uh, so, verse 2. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold around it. So now it gets heavy with the gold. And he cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. Yeah. Have you guys ever held a gold bar? Yeah. Uh, I was showing, I don't know if it was Brock or who was it, confirmation student over at St. John's. Uh, we happened to be talking about gold. And one year, Faith and I went to, um, in Winnipeg, it was in North Dakota, closer to Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg had a, a mint, Canadian mint, you know, and there that's where they made, in Winnipeg they make all the pennies. And you, unlike in the United States, in Canada, you can go and watch them make the pennies. Like they have this walkway and you can look down and watch people make the pennies. But while you're waiting, they have a gold bar uh, on a pedestal. And uh, you're allowed to come and pick up the gold bar. And of course, it's, it's got a chain to this pedestal. And then uh, as you're doing this, there's a guard with a gun standing right like this, you know, with his hand on the, on the pistol there. Uh, and then and, but you can pick up the gold and do all you want with it. And but it's heavy, and it's, it's only like this big. And it's like 25 pounds, something like that, like, like, a, like a gold bar. It, it's dense and heavy. And so here, Bezalel is... Uh, making the ark, it's overlaid inside and outside with gold. The poles are overlaid with gold. And then on top, we have the mercy seat of pure gold that is two cubits and a half long and a cubit and a half its breadth. I mean, this thing is nice. But it would be heavy. Yeah. <laughs> well, heavy things are good. All right. Heaviness implies, you know, a quality there, right? That's what we tell ourselves. Uh, that heaviness implies quality. Like uh, my mother-in-law, if, if she's watching, hopefully they'll laugh. Um, when they wrap presents, they tend to put rocks in the boxes so that when you <laughs> lift it up, you go, "Oh man, this is something good. I'm getting a piece of the Ark of the Covenant here." You know, you know, to, of course, to fool people. You know, but but there's a heaviness there. Um, with books, you know, if you want to go, you know, and get a first edition, a hardcover copy of, of a novel you want, for example, you know, you're expected there's going to be some heft to that. The binding is going to be good, the cover is going to be good, uh, the paper is going to be nice, you know. Uh, but then a lot of times we can get used books at, at the library sale um, or at the Goodwill or something that are, are paperback that you get at the grocery store that's really very thin paper, very light, you know, and you can tell that there's a difference in quality, if nothing else, then based on the weight too, right? Uh, and so this whole thing is covered in gold, which is a precious metal, but it's also heavy. So it's, you know, this thing is high quality. Verse 7, and he made two cherubim of gold, he made them of hammered work on the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, he made the cherubim on its two ends. That's cool. Uh, the cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces to one another. Toward the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. Now, what do you know about the cherubim? Oh, yeah, Valentine's Day. Um, when the internet came out, there used to be this graphic of like a dancing baby that was supposed to be uh, a cherub. Uh, however, uh, cherubs aren't babies. Uh, cherubs are the uh, 
the angels in Isaiah chapter 6 that we're going to hear about, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, and Trinity Sunday, of the angels that have the six wings with two they covered their feet, and with two they covered their faces, and with two they flew. Uh, you know, uh, elsewhere, cherubs are described as being covered in eyes uh, because their job is to behold God uh, and praise Him. That's what their job is. You know, uh, angels aren't, you know, are spiritual beings. They aren't humans, and so they they look kind of like their job is. You know, so in the case of cherub, kind of scary looking. If you if you look up, you know, better illustrations than of the the baby angels. Um, I think a baby angel in medieval artwork is called like a puta, P-U-T-T-A, is uh, these baby angels. But cherubs, uh, and these ones, so the cherub's job is to behold God, to, to see God, to worship God. Which way are these, these angels on the ark facing? Yeah, well, they're facing in toward what? Well, what's on top of the ark? Yeah. Yeah, so the cherub's job is to behold God, to worship God, to sing his praise. Uh, and here we have, you know, not actual cherubim, gold cherubim, but they're not faced outward, they're faced inward toward the mercy seat where God had said Moses when, to Moses, when I come and talk to you, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to come on the mercy seat here. You know, th that, that's where I'm going to be. And so here are these golden cherubim, what are they doing? Facing inward. Pretty cool. Ten. You see this this stuff all it's not just random, you know. I think uh, if you if you never read Exodus and you never have any familiar with these things, it, it can appear to be well gobbledygook, but it's not random. You know, that there that there is reason behind this uh, in organization. Verse ten. He also made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. And he made a rim around it, a hand breadth wide, and made a molding of gold around the rim. He cast for it four rings of gold and fastened the rings to the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame were the rings, as holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table, and overlaid them with gold. And he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table, its plates and dishes for incense, and its bowls and flagons with which to pour drink offerings. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work, its base, its stems, stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers were of one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of its, so, its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand on the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch, so that for the six branches going out of the lampstand, and on the lampstand itself were four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their calyxes and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. Yeah. And he made it seven lamps and its tongs and its trays of pure gold. He made it and all its utensils out of a talent of pure gold. So 75 pounds. Now, Richard, I think, you know, when I think of you right now, I'm thinking of working with wood, right? And you could carve something like this out of a, a large piece of wood, right? You know, that it, you know, you could, you could carve this lampstand out, um, is it more difficult to do it out of one piece and then to, yeah. Can you imagine doing this with gold? 
And I guess you have to hammer it, right? Heat it up and hammer it and, ugh. I couldn't do it, that's for sure. So it would be, I'm looking at these pictures right here. Yeah. And like looking at this, the way you describe it, I mean, it's just, it looks like a candelabra. Mm -hmm. I mean, very interesting. Yeah, I would say, you know, so we've got, on ours happened to have seven. You know, but think of that freestanding from the ground. Uh, many churches have a similar sort of thing. Um, the Hebrew word is menorah, which we know from, uh, you know, around Hanukkah time. Right, uh, even Target sells like plastic menorahs and things like that, um, and dreidels and such. Um, but yeah, it's a lampstand, but it's 70, 75 pounds of gold. How would you like to be on the altar guild moving that around? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm What is that? Is it in, you know, in, in different uh, fantasy literature, there's different sources, types of fire, like dragon fire that burns super hot and things like that. But I think of, you know, how much is lost to us, you know, over the course of time, you know, I mean, li a lot of people talk about the, the Library of Alexandria being burnt and how many thousands of years of literature did we lose in that and technical manuals for all we know. And maybe they had methods of you know, creating a really hot fire uh, beyond even what we do. Maybe. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I talked before about I watched this video of how we think they built bridges in in the Middle Ages over rivers and like all sorts of interesting medieval machinery, uh, all without gasoline or diesel or electricity, you know. Um, and you know to do that today, I mean, when we build a bridge today, think of all the power equipment we use, you know, uh, and uh, you know, and the guys who come up with it, think of how much schooling they go to, to come up with this, and uh, you know, they didn't have that in the Middle Ages, you know, or they well they did, I guess Oxford and places like that have been around for a thousand years, but uh, not in the sense that we have it today, and so, you know. People in Bible times were not stupid, you know, and so maybe, maybe there was some sort of way to, to create super hot fire and to keep it fueled sufficient enough to be able to do this and uh, must add some really good oven mitts, I guess, um, as well. You know, I've got some oven mitts that are so thin that, you know, you get burnt even with the oven mitts on. Um, so I don't know how he did this. Cool, well. But this lampstand of one piece, that's the part that maybe blows my mind, is like one piece to make all this stuff. And am I saying that right, calyx? Is, I mean, it's part of a flower, right? So people who are into gardening, is that correct? Sure. I'm trying to think of my, my biology classes where you look at the parts of a flower. I forget. Calyx, calyx, calyx. I don't know. All right, making the altar of incense, verse 25. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its breadth was a cubit. It was square and two cubits was its height. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and around its sides and its horns, and he made a molding of gold around it. And he made two rings of gold on it under its molding on two opposite sides of it as holders for the poles with which to carry. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil also and the pure fragrant incense blended as by the perfumer. Chapter 38. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its breadth. 
it was square, and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils with bronze. And he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge, extending halfway down. He made four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. And he put the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with them. He made it hollow with boards. Okay, so the altar is hollow then, but this gets overlaid with bronze instead of gold. So I think of like a, in North Dakota we had a fireplace. Uh, we never used it because it needed to get cleaned and we didn't do that. Um, but we had, you know, fireplace tools, and those were bronze. Um, so the burnt offering is called the burnt offering because fire is involved. Um, and so in any case, it's going to be overlaid with bronze. The utensils are going to be bronze. But in this case, it's hollow, uh, and it's going to be easier to carry. Five cubits by five cubits by three. Verse 8. He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. I have no idea what that means. Verse 9. And he made the court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. Their twenty pillars and their twenty bases were of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, there were hangings of a hundred cubits. Their twenty pillars, their twenty bases were of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits. Their ten pillars and their ten bases, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the front to the east, fifty cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate were 15 cubits with their three pillars and three bases, and so for the other side. On both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three bases. All the hangings around the court were of fine twined linen, and the bases for the pillars were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. The overlaying of their capitals was also of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It was 20 cubits long and 5 cubits high in its breadth, corresponding to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were four in number. The four bases were of bronze, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their capitals and their fillets of silver. And all the pegs for the tabernacle and for the court all around were of bronze. So I think of uh, like railroad, what pegs, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking of is things to keep this all together. Those were made of bronze. But remember we did this that, so the tabernacle and the court were a rectangle, kind of like this, where uh, it was 100 cubits, on the north and south, and then 50 cubits on the east and west. So we're talking about a rectangle. Let's see, 100 cubits, so 100 times 18, 1,800 inches, so 150 feet-ish. So and we did, what did we decide on the length of this building? From the back wall to the front doors, I don't know. I feel like there's a, I don't know if there's the original plans or, or blueprints or what in the filing cabinet. Maybe I'll have to look and see what the dimensions all are. Make materials for the tabernacle. This is a good uh, reading comprehension test, isn't it? Well, it's, it feels like we've already read it. Well, we have. Yeah. 
yeah, we read the instructions, um, and now this is the, the building of it, just like we read about like Aaron's ordination, but that's going to happen in Leviticus. So this is the building of, of all that stuff that God gave the instructions for. That's, that's why it feels like we already read this. That I don't know. Yeah, the the burnt offering altars made of bronze. I think the 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 table where the incense was offered and then the bread of the presence that was gold. We read about that. But the I don't know, Richard. Do you have any insight into would would bronze be a hardier material than gold in that case? Gold's usually soft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when even like, when you get to the altar burnt offering, like you're offering a ram on there with horns, you know, and you're going to put that on the gold. I mean, that would could damage the gold from the horns and things like that. So the bronze is going to be hardier in that case. Um, you know, that's kind of what I felt too. And then there's also the principle of as you get further out from the Holy of Holies, from the Ark, then you start to get more things like bronze and silver as opposed to everything is gold. So as you get further out from the Ark of the Covenant, you know, there starts to be, I don't want to say loosening up on the materials because it's still pretty darn good, uh, but there's that principle as well. Um, so bronze is a hardier thing. Um, when you get out into the court, um, you know, when we're talking about these pillars that are going to get driven into the ground, that makes sense to be bronze as opposed to gold. Um, you know, the courtyard is also going to be somewhat more exposed to weather, I think. I mean, because there's, there's all sorts of curtains and different layers over the tabernacle itself, but there's not a roof to the courtyard of the tabernacle. Um, so there's that as well. So there's different, uh, I guess, resistances to different materials. And so maybe that makes sense when we start talking about why bronze for some things and, and why gold for others. That makes sense. Can we go back to that the bronze basin? Yeah. Like yeah. I don't know what that's about. Is that a mirror like what we have in here, or is it something different? Do I have my study Bible here? No, it's in back. Yeah, Joyce, do you have your study? Haven't I have your study Bible? Does it say anything? Okay, I'll have to look that up. I mean, mirrors, I mean, well, usually mirrors come up uh, when we talk about Paul, where he says, now we see, you know, through a mirror dimly, you know, usually. And then the, the question of mirrors in antiquity. Yes, mirrors did exist um, in antiquity. There, you know, people weren't vampires, you know, um, but mirror, mirrors did exist, yeah. Um, maybe not as pure as, you know, we go to, what's that store at the Crossroads Mall, or that, like, that home store? Yeah. You walk in, I mean, and there's 50-foot aisle all of mirrors or something like that, you know, and the, every single one of them perfect, you know. That, that maybe is not the case. Um, I think clear glass, for example, uh, didn't exist until... Uh, as in clear glass without any impurities at all, it didn't really exist until after Christ, uh, but glass still did. You know, it just wouldn't be as pristine as some of what we have today. So, um, but I'll look into that verse eight there. I don't really know what the deal is of that. Yeah, what the deal is with that? Yeah. Well, and it's just a little detail. Because the rest of it has such great detail. Right, just and then we have this: the mirrors of ministering women who ministered in the end. Well. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with that. Well, well, and what was the basin for? Well, what's it, what goes in the basin? What, what, in this case, it's water to wash their hands and their feet before they go in into the tabernacle. So uh, maybe uh, the women were there with a the towel. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, carrying the water back and forth. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. 
What's the deal with that? It's the altar gill. More information. More research needed. Okay. All right. Verse 21. Exodus 38. We're in verse 21. So now we're talking more about, oh, this is going to be the totals. Get your calculator ready. These are the records of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses. The responsibility of the Levites under the direction of Edomar, the son of Aaron the priest. And Edomar is one of the good ones. Uh, Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Oholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. So but a dude did a lot of the sewing. You know, uh, every now and then I'll happen upon a guy who knits. You know, Fair, fairly rarely, but it, it does happen, or, 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 or sews. I mean, I can sew kind of, not really. You know, but here it's a dude. You know, that's just fine. That's great. Twenty-four. Useful talent. All the gold that was used for the work, and all the construction of the sanctuary. The gold from the offering was 29 talents and 730 shekels, right? So 29 talents, a talent is 75 pounds. So 29 times 75 plus 730 shekels. And a shekel is 11 grams, two-fifths of an ounce. So, you know, get your calculator. By the shekel of the sanctuary. 25. The silver from those of the congregation who were recorded was 100 talents. That one's easier. Uh, 7,500 pounds of silver. Yeah. And 1,775 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. A baker, so that's about one fifth of an ounce. A baker ahead. That is half a shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary. For everyone who is listed in the records from 20 years old and upward, uh, for 603,550 men. So, um, that's, so that's the men who were 20 and older. So how many people? So we're talking about million, two million people here in total leaving Egypt. There, if there's if there's 603,000 men who are 20 and older, well, there's you know, boys who are younger than that, and then there's wives and children. You know. So that's, that's how many people we're talking about here. The hundred talents, verse 27. The hundred talents of silver were for casting the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil. A hundred bases for the hundred talents, a talent a base. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their capitals and made fillets for them. The bronze that was offered was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the bases for the entrance of the tent of the meeting, the bronze altar and the bronze grating for it, and all the utensils of the altar. The bases around the court and the bases of the gate of the court, and all the pegs of the tabernacle, and all the pegs around the court. So they kept track of what materials came in and then what they used it for, right? Uh, so these guys weren't joking around. They were making stuff, you know. Uh, what is it, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once? You know, that's what these guys are doing. Instead of measure, one, measure once, cut twice, or measure four times, cut four times, <laughs> you know. No, these, these guys knew what they were doing. It helps when God gives you the plan, I guess. 39. What time? Oh, we might do it. From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, they made finely woven garments. And there's a footnote that says, garments for worship, for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron, as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
He made an ephod of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. And then he hammered out gold leaf, and he cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and into the fine twined linen in skill design. They made for the ephod attaching shoulder pieces, joined to it at its two edges. And the skillfully woven band on it was of one piece with it, and made like it, of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones, enclosed in settings of gold filigree, and engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel. And he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he made the breast piece in skilled work in the style of the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. It was square. They made the breast piece doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth when doubled. And they set it in four rows of they set in it four rows of stones. A row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row, and the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. There were twelve stones with the, their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like signets, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. And they made on the breast piece twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breast piece. And they put the two cords of gold in the two rings at the edges of the breast piece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree. Thus they attached it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breast piece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attached them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breast piece should not come loose from the ephod, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So Aaron's going to get a workout wearing this stuff. And as pastor, I think of, uh, you know, during the summer, uh, it's pretty warm in the vestment. You know, here we have air conditioning, so here it's not so bad. Uh, but St. John's on some of those Sunday, Sunday mornings, uh, it's warm, you know, up there. Uh, I guess, he, Joyce, have you ever worshipped at St. John's in Fairbank? Not worshipped, I've been there, but not worshipped. Yeah. Uh, well, during the summer, uh, it, gets, it gets warm in there. Um, you know, especially so up front, and then I get up into the pulpit. But here, Aaron, they're in Israel, and he's going to be wearing all this stuff. You know, that's why they need the incense. Was there ever any rumor for the most saved to be dressed in most exactly what they were doing the first time? I guess, yeah. Well, it said that God gave them the spirit to be able to do this. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All this is by hand. Yeah. Totally. Well, I mean, for some things, looms have existed for right. forever. So, I mean, for some things, it's probably like when we're talking about these curtains, these big, huge things. But for the garments, we're look at, looking at handmade material here. Yeah. And not just handmade garments, but the binding of fabric. Yeah, the fabric and and then all the embroidery on there is all by you know and all like the the uh the different things that go into it. Super cool. Yeah, then do we know those as we would know those today or do No idea. It 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 boggles the mind how yeah. this was done. Super cool.
Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe they killed a bunch of snakes and took their fangs. I don't know. Or porcupine quills or something like that. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Cool. Plundering the Egyptians. Plundering the Egyptians. You know, yeah. Yeah, God, well, God said on the, on the way out that he was going to give the Egyptians a, a favorable disposition toward the Israelites and that they should ask their neighbors for their gold and silver and precious stuff, and the Egyptians would give it to them. Uh, and so then it says, they, thus they plundered the Egyptians when they left. And where the Egyptians get it, well... Um, Egyptians have been around for a long time, you know. Uh, even when Abraham was up doing his wandering, you know, 600 years before all this, uh, you know, the Egyptians had been around for a long time, uh, and they were a very prosperous people. Um, in agriculture, in mining, um, I don't know if they were, were seafaring so much, um, but very prosperous and very smart, and so... Um, yeah, was able Israel able to plunder enough to, to build the tabernacle? Yeah, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, it would boggle us. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of people out in the desert. Where are they going to get all this stuff? Well, actually, we read earlier in Exodus that the, they, the Egyptians gave it to them. You know, so it's not like, uh, they're wandering through the desert, and, oh, look, 7,500 pounds of silver. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's build a casino. Uh, you know, no, they, they, they plundered the Egyptians. And the Egyptians acquired it uh, over, over time as a nation because they were a prosperous um, and, you know, well-to-do nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had mines. You know, they had salt mines. I've seen Ben-Hur, you know. <laughs> Right, because that's what happens. You know, uh, Charlton Heston's up on the roof, and then the roof tile comes down and kills a Roman. Then he ends up in the salt mines, and you know, and then they're picking out slaves. And Charlton Heston's got shining white teeth, so they take him. And uh, you guys have all seen Ben Hur, right? No. Oh, no. Yeah. Guess what we gotta do for Bible study? Yeah. <laughs> See, it's it's called Ben Hur, but it's really about Jesus. Uh, because the, the whole, throughout the whole movie, Charlton Heston's character, Ben-Hur, has run-ins with Jesus, including the crucifixion and, and resurrection. Uh, very interesting. And the book, too, uh, brings us out uh, that uh, it's told, I don't know if it's not told by Ben-Hur, but it's told by, I think, one of the Magi who ran into Ben-Hur. Let me tell you a story about this guy. Uh, it's very interesting. Cecil B. DeMille... Um, good movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even there's, there's an older Ben-Hur from like 1920 or something like that um, before they were talkies. Oh, no, they do talk, but then there's subtitles. Um, yeah, Samson and Delilah was another, another popular one that Cecil B. DeMille did. David and Bathsheba. Um, you know, good movies. Yeah. All right, let's keep going, though. We're getting uh, off topic. Where did all this stuff come from? Well, it came from the Egyptians. And where did they get it? Well, they, they acquired, you know, where do we get all our stuff? You know, we acquire it over time, I guess. You know, I think of uh, my cell phone, you know, and how many different sorts of precious metals and materials are in that? You know, where does that come from? <laughs> Unfortunately, probably from some eight-year-old in a mine somewhere, you know, in uh, Congo. Okay, verse 22. Oh, we're so close. He also made the robe of the ephod woven of all blue, and the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment, with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the, ro the robe. Excuse me. 
between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe for ministering, as the Lord had commanded Moses. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the caps of fine linen, and the linen undergarments of fine twined linen, and the sash of fine twined linen, and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns embroidered with needlework as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And they tied to it a cord of blue to fasten it on the turban above as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins, and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles, poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps, with the lamps set, and all its utensils and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for, of his sons for their service as priests, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, so had they done it. Then Moses blessed them. Let's see. Okay, let's keep going. See if we can do it. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall put in it the ark of the testimony, and you shall screen the ark of the veil, and you shall bring in the table and arrange it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. And you shall put the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. And you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Side note, so this is supposed to happen, the tabernacle is supposed to go up the first day of the first month, you know, otherwise known as the first day of the year, you know, the, for the Hebrew calendar. Now, for us, the first day of the year is January 1st, right? How many days is, after, is that after Christmas? Christmas to January 1st. No. Eight. eight days. What happens eight days after Jesus is born? For what? He's actually presented twice. Uh, eight days after a Hebrew male was born, he circumcised. So they took Jesus to the temple and gave him the name Jesus, you know, which we celebrate January 1st. And here, God says in the first day of your year, that's when you're going to set up the tabernacle. Just an interesting aside that occurred to me. Okay, let's keep going. Now I won't stop again. Verse 9. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him 
that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, two years out from Egypt now, in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put, the place in, put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. And now comes the Old Testament reading for Christmas Day. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Cool. So the cloud comes and fills the tabernacle, and Moses can't even go in because the cloud is so thick. Cool. Right. Right. Well, the parallel for us would be we have a sanctuary where we are free to gather as often as much as we want for as long as we want. We have uh, Bibles in a lot of our pews, and in the back there we have the Lord's Supper whenever we feel like it. Uh, but what are we all tempted to do? Not go to church. You know, and this is true in every Christian congregation in all the entire world, uh, including our own, that... Um, you know, and, and Fairbank too, that we have all these wonderful things, all of which testify to us that God is with us, to bless us and to forgive us. And what do we do? Go the other way. You know, uh, and... Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and so, I mean, this is just a common thing that it's, it's so easy to look back and fault God's people then and be like, you knuckleheads, you know. But we're the knuckleheads, you know. Right, and, you know, all the things, if we dive into the book of Hebrews, all these things are, are a shadow of, of what is to come in Christ and, and in the resurrection. Their, their job, all these sacrifices, was to point ahead, you know, to Christ, uh, 
whom we have now seen. You know, Peter says that, uh, you know, the ones who prophesied before us, you know, inquired in the Holy Spirit, you know, when all this was, when all this would happen, and they longed to see it, you know, but now you have, is what Peter says, or Jesus, that, you know, that so many people, he says to the apostles, that so many people have longed to see and hear what you now see and hear, you know. Um, so we're the same. I mean, we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and yet, what do we do? We are the same temptation as to not come. You know, uh, I guess it's really no different than fire and cloud. We behave the same. At least the temptation is the same. You know. Thankfully, by the Holy Spirit, you know, we, we, we fight and resist that temptation. We ask that the, the Spirit would continue to work in our lives to, to stem that temptation. You know, and that, that may come with time, but you know, because we are in the flesh, the old Adam continues to be around. You know, um, you know and that's just hard. You know, and uh, this fall, I'm going to be starting up. <laughs> it's you know, every member visits took a, a byway with COVID, but uh, this fall is three years since I've been here, so it's going to start up again. And um, there are some members that you know have not been at church in a long time. You know, between our congregations, that I'm going to be calling on, and you know, hopefully. The Lord will bless that and, and bring, you know, a return to normal worship. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, uh, for some, old Adam has has grabbed, you know, a lot stronger than he should. So, but it's super cool. I mean, here and here to connect this to Christ again, the the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. Um, that is the word that John uses in Greek when he says, "And the Lord dwelt among us." You know. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Same word there as used for the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. And that the, the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle points ahead to uh, the Son of God coming in the flesh, you know, for us. So, and, and that's why that reading is for Christmas Day. You know. But we are, we are over time, so we should uh, be at a stopping point. Do think about what we want to do next. Uh, whether we want to do another book of the Bible, uh, whether we want to do a topic. Um, there is a study somebody mentioned last week on you know, differences between Lutheranism and, and other you know, denominations. There's actually a whole series out on CPH called The Lutheran Difference, where they go through like the Lord's Supper or baptism, um, even Christ, um, and things like that. We could do something like that. Um, maybe think about that and, and let me know your thoughts on Sunday or, or write it down and give me a note maybe. That might help too. Um, but let's go ahead and end with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this opportunity again to be here in your sanctuary and to hear your word. Uh, most especially this day to hear about the tabernacle and all these things that are in it, all the sacrifices and such. And we confess, Lord, that all these things uh, are shadows of, of what were to come uh, in you. The sacrifices in particular pointed ahead to your sacrifice for us on the cross. And we thank you that by your death and resurrection, you have secured for us the forgiveness of our sins and hope for the life to come. We ask that according to your promise, you would send us your Holy Spirit, that you would not leave us without consolation, but you, that you would send us the Helper, our Advocate and Comforter, and we ask that by the Holy Spirit, you would direct our eyes always to you, that the Holy Spirit would have free course in our hearts uh, to fight against the old Adam and help us remain firm in the one true faith. Bless us this day according to your will. Grant us safe passage in all that we say and do uh, until we return here again to hear your word and receive your gifts. In your name we pray. Amen.